Ten days ago, I was scheduled to be on a flight to Israel with about 60 or so other Westgators, and we were going to be uh, spending, you know, over a week in the Holy Lands, walking through um, those, that, those great historical places. And then today, um, I was supposed to be at Pebble Beach with a bunch of other church leaders in the Bay Area, and we would be playing today, the, the plan was, that we would be playing um, on Pebble Beach, suffering for Jesus there. Um, kidding. Wow, everything's changed. The trip was postponed. The golfing event was postponed. The um, shelter in place order was put into place. Um, we started scrambling about how to try to get services to you and how to, how to be available to you and, and move forward in this. Everything just got uncertain in a really quick way. And I learned new terms about social distancing and those kinds of things and how I can honor people in this difficult time. And I'm certain, I'm certain that it's been the same for you, that you had plans that were much different than what you're living in today. This kind of uncertainty um, is dangerous for us because it does a couple of things. It's uncertainty, like physical pain, um, has the potential to drive us towards self-centeredness. It, 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 it moves us in these uncertain times to worry about ourselves, to get centered on ourselves and consumed with today and what it means for me. We begin to think in terms of survival and protecting what we have. We begin to um, finally find time to pray, but when we do pray, it's, it's more like a grocery list of, oh God, please don't let me get sick. Please protect the ones that I love. Oh God, please let me find some toilet paper somewhere. The problem is that we become so focused on our needs and our particular situations that we lose sight of some of the things that are really most important about how we live. And we miss the fact that God may be up to something, something very special in this time. There may be something that he really does want us to say and, and, a, and a way of living that he wants us to model. The COVID-19 and the coronavirus has certainly raised the uncertainty level in every single one of us. But the truth is, our future is always uncertain. We're just more aware of it now. And it's in this time that we see just how much we can start to try to control things. Um, it, it, and this uncertainty kind of shatters the illusion of control. Um, we desire control. We want control. We want things to be in certain orders and in certain ways. We use power, we use money, we use sexuality, we use even religion to try to exercise control over how our life is unfolding. And when we can't have control, what we get is fear. The fear of, of missing out on what was, was we hoped to do, the fear of our health, the fear of a virus. We become afraid. And in that, we begin to experience a lot of anxiety and worry. And I know that this is true across our city. Just some of the examples of some of the prayer requests that have come in for us is, is people that are a part of our community that are ER doctors, that are, that are very concerned about their exposure and their contagion level for the, the COVID-19. Um, some nursing homes, just another other prayer request, some nursing homes that have been shut down and, and those of us who have aging parents um, worrying about how they'll be cared for and, and what's going on there. Local businesses and, and in particularly small businesses um, that are run by people that are a part of our community that are saying, we just don't understand how we're going to make it. The bills will continue even though we can't operate. Waitresses and waiters and chefs and other people that are working on an hourly wage that their businesses and their opportunities for work have been taken away. And it just goes on and on. Even, even the church here, we're trying to figure out how do we operate when we cannot gather? Since the community of people is about being community, how do we operate? And, and I'm sure that all of you, that you dealing with this uncertainty 
these kinds of questions. I found a quote that really did state it for me as I, I, I just ask myself, what am I really kind of worried about? And what do I find as a consistent theme throughout my journals and my prayers that I write out in those journals? And this, this quote really kind of captured it. I want to be relevant and popular. I want my desires fulfilled and my pain minimized. I want a manageable relationship with an institution rather than a messy relationship with real people. I want to be transformed by the image of Christ by showing up at entertaining events rather than through the hard work of discipline. I want to wear my faith on my sleeve and not look at the darkness of my own heart. And above all, I want a controllable God. I want a divine commodity to do my will on earth as if it were in heaven. And that kind of control is not available. God is not some divine commodity that simply is, exists to do our bidding. What happens because of this is the anxiety level. When we begin to realize that we are not in control, the anxiety level just goes up and up. And I've been, I've been actually kind of concerned about, kind of anx anxious about the anxiety level of our country and our response to um, this coronavirus. And I want to just tell you that Jesus has some things to say in here about worry that are quite amazing. Now, I'm not talking about uncertainty. I'm not talking about confusion or doubt. I'm, I'm talking about a concern for our future that casts doubt on the character of God. A concern for our future that casts doubt on the character of God. In other words, we begin to look at things and we think we've got to go in some kind of a hyper-management mode and hyper-controlling mode because obviously the coronavirus has overcome God and his ability to work things out. We begin to cast doubt and, and think of God as less than able to be able to handle some of the things that are coming our way. Now, I also want to say that there's this anxiousness can sometimes be even seen as positive. Um, the word for anxious or worry is used 19 times in the New Testament. We're going to look at it prim primarily in Matthew chapter 6. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a word that comes from a reference to strangling or being choked. So almost every time that it's ever talked about in the scriptures, we find that it's, it's actually a very negative thing. That it's actually keeping us from breathing and existing as we were intended to. We see it especially in Philippians chapter 4, which I'm going to talk to you at the end of the message, where it says, do not be anxious or worried about anything. And so it's, this, it's in this context that we begin to move forward. And I want to give you two definitions before we get to Matthew 6 that have been really helpful for me. Fear is the anticipation of something bad. To be afraid is to, to kind of project that something's going to happen that's bad and, and you begin to experience it. And then worry, I love this definition, worry is experiencing failure in advance. You actually get to experience if, if failure is in fact what you end up experiencing. You get to, if you're worried about it, you get to do it twice. And in, it's in this context that Jesus would say, Man, I don't want you to live that kind of life. I don't want that kind of choking um, anxious worry to be a part of how you exist and how you live. I don't want you to live in that kind of fear. And so it's in Matthew chapter 6 that he begins, not begins, but actually continues a messaging. And what's happened is, is that we're right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has talked about what it means to be blessed and redefines who in fact is well off in the kingdom of God. And then he begins to systematically redefine the Ten Commandments, most of the Ten Commandments, in, in Jesus' language, in New Testament language. And by the time you get to chapter 6, he wants to talk to us very importantly about worry. Verse 25, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body what you will wear. 
Now, right away he's saying, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about worry, but I'm going to talk to you about worry about in the area of things that are, are um, actually important and, and critical, and then non-critical. So he says, don't worry about your life, critical, and don't even worry about your body, non-critical. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? I mean, the, this first idea is that in the critical areas of life itself, Jesus is saying, look at the birds. It's just a simple illustration of looking how well the birds are cared for. Aren't we worth more than many birds? And then he says, and by the way, just to make sure you know, it's not going to help anyway if you worry. He goes on verse 27, and who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? It doesn't help. It's not beneficial. And why do you worry about clothes? Verse 28, now he goes into the non, um, you know, non-needed uh, or uh, critical areas. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. I mean, some of us are worried at this time about some pretty critical areas of survival. But some of us, even in the midst of all of the things that are going around on us, are, are, are find ourselves still worrying about the non-critical things. Some of us are freaking out about things that we're not able to do that really aren't critical to our existence. And Jesus is saying in both of these areas, you know, that both areas, I don't want you to live a life that gets enslaved to these kinds of things. Verse 30, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how or will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? It's kind of the same argument that he gave earlier is that with the birds is that, man, you're way more valuable than birds. And now he's saying, you, you're way more valuable than grass that just gets, it gets just thrown away and burned up. So don't worry, verse 31. Do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after thee, all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And then he kind of gives us this giant application step. This, this, this is a, the antidote to doing battle against worry. Verse 33, a famous verse. You've probably heard it before. Seek first. Don't worry, but instead, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, all the critical and the non-critical, all those things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. He says the, the antidote to doing this is to live a life in such a way where you're actually, with the priority of God and his kingdom, you're seeking that first. Well, what does it mean to seek his kingdom? It's to seek God's honor, his reign, and his will where God is honored and he reigns and his will is accomplished, that is his kingdom. That, that is where God is king. And his righteousness is not seeking salvation. We're not, we're not talking about seeking redemption. We're talking about seeking a life in the redemption or what we would call justification, not justification, but sanctification. What we would call sanctification, that we would seek that sanctified life of living like Christ. I mean, Jesus' challenge to us is that we would somehow live a prioritized life where we seek first his kingdom. Now, how do you do that? I mean, you, you begin to establish in your mind the good character of God. Let me just read for you just a few of my favorite verses about God's strength when things go a little bit awry. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. 
If you think about that verse, you think God made everything there is and placed every star in place. In fact, he numbered them and called them by name and holds them exactly where they are. This coronavirus is not beyond his power. Nothing, nothing, including COVID-19, is too difficult for him. Isaiah 41.10, you've I, I quote this verse often, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you. And that's that word for worry. Do not anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I've, and I've told you this before is that we get the strong hand. When he comes to help us, we don't just get his off hand. We don't just get part of his attention. We get all of God's strength. And he's saying, don't, don't look about and be crazed by all that you see. I am here, I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will help you with my righteous right hand. And then Psalm 31, 19. How great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on them. It's the idea of just extravagant generosity. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection. And I picked this verse because that word for protection is shelter. So when we got the shelter in place order, God says, I will lavish this shelter on you and bless you before I'm watching work. There's a, there's a teaching inside of this passage that's kind of hidden from us that speak English, but that the Hebrew audience would have heard. And it's this Hebrew phrase called kama yoter. Kama yoter means how much more. In fact, I, I, I called a, a woman who's here in the Silicon Valley and she's my Hebrew expert. She's Jewish and speaks Hebrew fluently. And she, I said, tell me about this kama yoter. And she said, oh, it's actually a phrase that, that some Jewish people will use all the time and they'll use it like this, kama va kama yoter. And she said, they'll move their hand, kind of like, kind of like this, like it means how and how much more. Kama va kama yoter. And it's this principle of, of going from a light to heaviness. And literally it means going from light to heavy. And that's what Jesus was saying. If he cares for the birds, how would he not care for you? Kama va kama yoter. If he cares for the grass and the flowers of the grass, how will he not come also care for you? How much more value are you? And so why waste your energy on the things that are important? But when there's a God who says, how much more do I love? I love you so much more than you can ever imagine. Why waste your energy being choked down by the worry of this life? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, everybody that hears this message, nobody will get sick. I'm not saying that God takes away. He's not a genie in the bottle, and he's certainly not Santa Claus. But he's saying, when, as you go through these things, I will go with you, and I will go with you as a father who loves you so much more than you can imagine. Find courage here. Take hope in this. I'm reminded when my sons were very little babies, and I would read to them, as almost every night I would go into their room and I would read them out of Joshua 1, where it says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the, from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And then he says in verse nine, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be encouraged. Understand that there's a loving God who loves you. How much more? So much more. I want to encourage you this week, if, if you haven't already done it, that you might, you might grab 
a part of the scripture and begin to memorize it. And, and as we work through our Lent um, opportunities this week, um, we're going to bring this verse up for you several different times. And it's in the book of, of Philippians chapter 4. Beginning at verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So this idea first is, is it, Paul's writing that we rejoice when he's in prison. Paul's writing that we, that we can let our gentleness be known when he's chained to a Roman guard. And then it says this in verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all human comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. As we go and live this life, may you be people who have such confidence in the love and goodness of God that your worry is diminished and your faith is grown. God, we confess, I confess, that I am anxious, I am worried, I am choked by some of the events that are going around, and I am not sure how to move forward. Would you help establish in my mind the goodness of who you are, the comma yoter, how much more love you have for us. And may that bring confidence in me. May that bring faith, stronger faith in us that we might navigate these days in a way that honors you, glorifies Christ, and also serves others. Thank you for such a time as this. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your amazing love. The how much more love that you pour into our lives. And how well you've demonstrated that through Jesus Christ. We thank you for him being willing, willing to take on the sin of mankind, carry it to Calvary's cross, and, and be crucified and, and then rise from the third day, offering eternal life. God, we praise you for that. And we thank you that in that reality, we can live today. Help us to do so in Jesus' name. Amen.